Good afternoon and uh, welcome along. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be back with you for uh, the second Greenhouse Startup Demo Day here at this beautiful lecture theatre and really pleased to have air conditioning. <laughs> um, you're in for a real treat this afternoon. We have um, a fantastic programme ahead. Um, and just to say, welcome if you're joining us virtually too. I hope you have aircon wherever you're joining us from. Uh, before we kick off, I just have some um, brief information, some background and um, uh, some outline of what you can expect this afternoon too. Now, the Greenhouse Accelerator kicked off in uh, January 2021 uh, as part of the new Centre for Climate Change Innovation. And since then, 45 teams have participated in the 12-month programme of support. And the startups you will be hearing from throughout the course of this afternoon form part of the second intake of that programme. Um, in fact, the Greenhouse uh, is actually open for um, applications for its fourth cohort as we speak. So if you know anyone that you think would be good, please let them know they have until the 4th of July to apply. Uh, this afternoon will be split into three sections uh, with guest speakers to kick off each section, followed by four pitches from our startups. And we will be asking for your participation throughout. Um, please do keep your phone accessible. Just uh, if you haven't already, switch it to silent. Please do that now. Uh, we aim to wrap up by around quarter to five, um, and we'll invite you to join us for networking until around half past seven, and each startup will have a standing table just outside, uh, so hopefully they will be really easy to find. And if you're struggling to find uh, a group that you'd like to speak to, please do just keep an eye out for the CCCI team who are going to be around with badges, and we'll hopefully raise a hand and you'll be able to see them at some point in the room. Uh, and you can ask them any questions you have. Just a final point to say, uh, there are no fire alarm drills uh, planned, so if you hear it, it's the real thing. And I'd ask that you uh, head to the fire evacuation points, which are marked throughout this building. There are uh, wardens among the RI staff, uh, and they will be on hand to get you down to the fire uh, gathering point, which is located on Grafton Street. So just a reminder, if you hear a fire alarm, it's not a drill, please do leave the building. Similarly, with first aid, um, if you need any help, and there are people on hand to help you from the CCCI team, and you can find them by their name badge, which has the CCCI written on it, as you'd expect. So, I'm Raya El Salahi. I will be with you throughout the afternoon and uh, be introducing you to the range of guest speakers and putting your questions uh, to the startups too. And really, really pleased to be back with you to do that. Uh, now it's uh, time to hand you over to our first key speaker. And really, really pleased to welcome Elisa Gilbert, Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute uh, for Climate Change and Environment, and also the Interim Director for the Centre of Climate Change Innovation based right here at the RI. So please put your hands together for Elisa. Thank you all for coming and welcome to the Centre for Climate Change Innovation here at the Royal Institution. Um, it's great to have you all here again, um, six months since our last demo day and a chance for you to hear from our latest crop of climate change battling startups. Um, quite a bit has changed in the last six months. I guess that's always the case. Um, and last week, I was speaking at a CBI conference on net zero. And I was asked the question if, in the face of current global geopolitical circumstances, I felt optimistic about what we're going to do to tackle climate change. And I thought being asked to be optimistic in general is quite a harsh thing. But I felt like that was perhaps the wrong question. I mean, in general, I actually am an optimist, but that wasn't really the question. Um, but I think the important thing is to remain determined and focused on this issue despite a changing context. This is the way the circumstance has been in relation to climate change for a long time. And one of the things that's happened since we last met some of us in this auditorium was the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's a group of leading international scientists from all around the world published their most recent update reports on the agreed consensus science around climate change and its impact. And one of the um, key findings there, um, which this may seem just sort of gut intuitive to you, but it's important that it's endorsed by scientists, is that climate change is already and has impacted people around the world. But importantly, it exacerbates where there are existing problems. And so the more that we see geopolitical challenges affecting things like food security, um, and the more that we see you know, that happening to vulnerable people around the world, we can know that that actually is overlaid often with the impacts of climate change. And that's why it continues to be important that we battle this long-term 
important issue alongside the urgent important issues that we see happening around us. So our, this challenge remains as important as ever, um, and I continue to be inspired by the startups that we support in the Greenhouse Programme. Um, I was just, just saying earlier that one of the things that I'm aware of is that every single startup is working so hard at a very specific challenge, and each of those things needs to be solved for us to achieve our global goals on climate. So every specific area is important. Um, so just to tell you something about the Center for Climate Change Innovation as a whole, what we're trying to do is create a home here in London and here at the RI in particular for climate innovators to come together. Part of that is for us to support these very early stage startups and entrepreneurs develop the skills that they need and develop their own particular business ideas. We want to help them meet investors, some of you who are in the room, um, but we also want to help create success for them to scale up and deliver emissions reductions at scale, perhaps first in London in the UK, perhaps first somewhere else in the world, um, and then scale up to help us approach this global challenge. And that requires innovation in lots of other ways too. So we also intend to make this a place where we have discussions about policy barriers and policy opportunities. What are the regulatory challenges that stop these innovative approaches from really taking off and scaling up? So this, we want to be a home and a connector to climate innovation in all its forms, and we would like you all to continue to be part of that really important and growing community. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Catherine Matheson, who is the relatively newly appointed director of the Royal Institution, this fantastic um, and long-standing institution where we stand, and one of our absolutely key partners in the Center for Climate Change Innovation. So Catherine. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome to all of you uh, here in the theatre or watching online. Uh, as, um, as Elisa said, I am relatively new to the Royal Institution. I joined a couple of months ago. My name's Catherine and um, I thought that those of you who are here for the first time might be as interested as I was when I joined two months ago to find out what the Royal Institution is really for. So I went back to have a look at what it says back from 1799, um, a public institution for facilitating the general introduction of useful mechanical inventions, I think that's on some of you in the audience, uh, and for teaching the application of science to the common purposes of life. And I don't know anything which is quite as much of a common purpose as climate change is for our generation today. So I feel that you are all in exactly the right place today. Uh, and I hope you feel the same way. Um, it's also very appropriate that you're here today, uh, or with us today, because in this building was the very first discovery of greenhouse gases. So John Tyndall uh, made this discovery using what I think is technically called Tyndall's tube, uh, which was a tube made from glass, copper, iron and wax. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and discovered that water vapour absorbs uh, the infrared heat radiated by the Earth. And that discovery obviously spawned a whole bunch of more discoveries, uh, which we now rely on to understand our planet and our, uh, the effects of humans on our planet. But that was the starting point. And one of the things for John Tyndall and for many of the other scientists and innovators who worked in this building since 1799, so Michael Faraday, William Bragg, Lawrence Bragg, etc., cetera, um, for them, it was really important that their work was not done in an ivory tower, somewhere away from the general public and from the people who would be uh, using the inventions or the materials. They were constantly in dialogue with public audiences. So people would come every week and sit where you're sitting, and people, uh, John Tyndall, et cetera, would say, well, this, this is my discovery. This is, let me show you how it works. Let me show you what it means. And in those debates, and those question settings, that shaped how the scientists and innovators did their work too. And a key proponent, a key component of that was the demonstrations they did in thinking about how can I explain this phenomenon or this discovery? Uh, I haven't got any demonstrations up my sleeve today. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's a bit messy. Uh, but, um, uh, but those of you who've been to Royal Institution events before or whoever, who've ever watched the Christmas lectures on TV, will know how important the demonstrations are for the, uh, for the work that we do here today. So I feel very strongly that you are following in the footsteps of John Tyndall and many others. 
um, in order to uh, uh, teach science for the common applications of, uh, of life. Um, we also do a range of other programs. So I wanted to mention we do some hands-on workshops for young people uh, in science, uh, maths, engineering, computing. And underneath our feet today, there are some teenagers from a school in North London. I mean, in a proper room, not in the basement. Um, <laughs> They're in a lab extracting their own DNA. And that work goes on every day of term. So we also take many of our most amazing demonstrations out on the road to schools across the country. And so I encourage you to get involved in any of those uh, programs and to come to the events that we have here in this theatre. Um, there's usually a couple every week, so there'll be something that interests you. Um, and many of them you can uh, join as a live stream as well. So you're very welcome. I'm really excited to be meeting some of you later, and I hope you have a fantastic afternoon. Thanks. Um, right, thank you so much to our guest speakers kicking things off, and I'm sure you join me in being really excited at the prospect of the next generation of really, really exciting climate innovators having the chance to meet with you and perhaps take their ideas to the next stage this afternoon. Um, let me in just a moment introduce you to the first of those speakers, but I do just want to let you know how you can take a part by, uh, take part by um, voting, <coughs> submitting questions and uh, being involved today. And you can do that whether you're watching online or with us in the room here uh, via the Mentimeter uh, site. And you can access that via your phone, which I hope, as I mentioned before, is still on silent. So to do that, all you need to do is head to menti.com. Um, and uh, in just a moment, you will see details of this pop up on the screen. But there is a code that you need to enter. Uh, if you have a pen or uh, you can jot this down on your phone, I'll give you that code now. It's 36610177. That's 36610177. And that will remain on the screen once it changes um, throughout. So you'll be able to keep an eye on that. There will also be a QR code uh, which will pop up on the screen. There you go, as if by magic. And you can use that uh, towards the end of the pitches to submit your questions and vote via there too. Um, after hearing each pitch, we'll ask that you uh, submit a score. And you do that in three key areas. And those are, number one, the commercial potential of what you've heard. Uh, number two is the climate impact of the innovation. And number three is the quality of the pitch. So please just bear that in mind. Commercial potential, climate impact, and quality of the pitch. And at the end of today's event, we will announce the top three highest scoring teams who uh, will receive an award. So please do not forget to participate using Mentimeter and you can uh, scan that QR code or enter the number that's on the screen. So that's enough from me. Let's uh, get on with the first round of really exciting pitches. And to kick things off, I'd like to welcome uh, Barney, the founder of Ceratech, who will be delivering zero carbon concrete. Please put your hands together for Barney. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Barney, the co-founder of Cyrotech. Lovely to see you all. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about concrete. Uh, humans have been building with concrete for millennia. It's something we can't do without. I think we may have developed a rather unhealthy attachment to the stuff. We produce more than two cubic meters of concrete for every man, woman, and child on the planet every year. That's 30 billion tons. And all of that concrete comes with a hefty carbon price tag. But it might not have to, because at Cyrotech, we have completely decarbonized concrete. The glue that holds concrete together is cement. It's amazing stuff, but its production is very carbon intensive. Cement is responsible for 8% of all human CO2 emissions. Uh, and because of that, it's common in industry to replace some of your cement in your concrete with a waste product, such as fly ash, for example that has no associated CO2 emissions. So say you replace 30%, it reduces the emissions of your concrete overall by about the same 30%. Of course, that only gets you part of the way there. So at Cyrotech, we took a different approach. We have developed a process that allows us to deliver a new class of infrastructure materials derived directly from industrial waste CO2. Um, and so we can sequester it permanently in the built environment. Our flagship product is um, it's a material called silica, and it's a cement replacement material too. So it works in the same way industry are used to, um, so mitigating emissions through partial replacement. But we go one step further, because as our process consumes CO2, 
these negative emissions are associated with and sold alongside our products. So we can increase the emissions reduction from 30% to 100%. And this is how we can deliver truly carbon zero concrete that looks and acts and behaves the same as normal concrete. You can hardly tell the difference. By targeting concrete, we unlock an immediately accessible market of 130 million with just one kiln partnership in just the UK. The total UK market is worth 10 times this, so 1.3 billion. And globally, the cement market is worth over $330 billion. And of course, this is projected to increase as we continue to build, what is it, a New York City every month or something. Um, so we, we view industrial CO2 uh, not as a problem, but as a valuable commodity. And this transforms heavy industrial emitters into our suppliers. Syrotech then acts as a manufacturer, just adding value to CO2 and delivering products that are in high demand from our customers. So, namely, I guess private and public developers and contractors. We've had people get in touch with us trying to build houses, and I've had to let them down gently, saying I only have a few buckets of the stuff. So it would have to be a very small house if you wanted to do that now. The, the foundations on which Serotech has been built is uh, a lot of academic R&D. We're an imperial spin-out. Uh, we've done significant prototyping, scaling up as best as I can. Um, we've gone from little cubes like this to big blocks like this. I encourage you to come and have a look at them. Um, and working with industry, which I think is so critical to make sure we're delivering a product that we know they want to use. There are lots of ideas floating around, but industry is uh, a little slow to take up some of these ideas because they're so different. So we've been working with them every step of the way. In the future, uh, we're currently designing um, a pilot facility with an industrial partner. This will allow us to sequester some real emissions from a real emitter and also produce significant quantities of this material so that we can actually upscale our testing and keep building industrial confidence as best we can. And of course, all of this with an eye on globally decarbonizing concrete over the next couple of decades. That's the aim, anyway. I'm very lucky to work with a team that I think are uniquely qualified to deliver this. As I said, we're an imperial spin-out, so we have a wealth of just brilliant academics who are helping me as scientific advisors and some ex-industry, the likes of Dr. Mike Cook, who designed, I think, half of London. So we're very lucky to work with him. Um, and, I mean, if you wanted to get involved, and this is with or without getting your hands dirty, because, of course, it is concrete, so it's not, it's not the cleanest job in the world. Um, we're looking for industrial partners who are trying to decarbonize. We're looking for customers, developers, if you want to build a house and you want to or new patio or something, then we would happily sell you some zero carbon concrete that you can stick it all together with. I think there is no neutral when it comes to the environment. Our impacts can either be positive or negative. And concrete has had one over on us for the past 2,000 years. I think it's time that we change that. So thank you very much. Oh. Sorry. Do I go back? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank Brian, you. well done. Never easy to be the first to go up, but well done. Brilliant pitch. Um, just a reminder, you can now submit your questions using menti.com, um, and it may require you just to refresh the page in order to do so, uh, but uh, please get your questions in now. And I'm going to kick off with a question uh, for you about the raw materials that you use, Barney, and what they are, mm. um, and whether they're available in the scale needed to match production. So, yeah, we have two raw materials, I guess. One is waste CO2, and as we're all aware, there's no shortage of that. Uh, and the other one is, um, is a mineral called olivine. Uh, it comes from a family, it's like magnesium silicates, and it's, it's, it's what the entire crust is made up of. So there's no shortage there. Obviously, concrete's a big problem, but there's an awful lot of this stuff in, underground, so we should be okay on that front. Um, and just a reminder, you can uh, get your questions in using the uh, menti.com uh, website. Uh, if you've got a question in, you can get it in now. And one's just popped up, which says, how do you create zero carbon cement if you're only adding 30% of Ceratex silica and 70% is still uh, conventional cement? Uh, great question. So that, that would be the case if you were doing what industry is currently doing. So if you're, what you're using as your replacement just has no emissions, so you're just replacing 30%, reduces it by 30%. But we don't have zero emissions. We have negative emissions. 
So yes, there's still 70% conventional cement in there, but all of the emissions produced in generating that cement can be offset through the carbon negativity of our replacement material, and we only need 30% to do that. Okay. Another one then asking, how long will it take for this to scale up to the point where it can replace conventional concrete? A while, I suppose. <laughs> it, it depends on how much money I have. Uh, if I, I, could, I could build a pilot plant tomorrow. Actually, that's not true. I couldn't build a pilot plant tomorrow. I've got no idea how to do that. But if we had, if we had the money and had the willingness to do that, I mean, I would love to see this in use over the next five or ten years. Uh, another question in asking how do you imagine, imagine getting to market once you're ready to scale? I think we will test the waters with a pilot facility. There are a number of different ways that we might integrate into the existing market. Obviously, there are mechanisms in place, such as the, the way that fly ash and blast furnace slag are currently used. There are mechanisms there to do that, and we imagine ourselves just being another grey powder that people can put into the back of a lorry and move to another place. So there's some work to be done there to see the best way to do that. And it might vary case to case depending on where your cement plant is and whether they like to do their own batching or like to send it to a batching facility. Awfully convoluted as an industry. Okay. Um, I think we have time for just one final question, which is um, how does your product compare in cost to conventional cement? Um, Again, this is a sort of an economies of scale thing. We believe that we're somewhere in the region of conventional cement prices. So you would say fly ash is cheap, that's $80 a ton. Portland cement is expensive, $120 per ton. And we believe through our LCAs and studies that we've done that we're somewhere in that range of 80 to 120. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Um, and just. Uh... <laughs> And uh, just a, a quick reminder that if you have any further questions, uh, Barney will be uh, around with his team uh, when it comes time to networking and in the break, so you can put those questions to him directly. Uh, next up, we have uh, Claire, the founder of Mori, a universal platform to make it easier for companies to switch to returnable packaging. Please uh, welcome Claire. Doesn't it all make you very, very anxious when there's something super urgent to be done and the clock is ticking and time is running out and nothing is happening? So the, the, I've wasted 12 seconds now, but I also have wasted 12 years of my life consulting with big food brands on sustainability issues. And what have they achieved in this time? When it comes to addressing the plastic crisis, these companies have completely failed. So my co-founder and I decided to do something about it. And we set up Mori. More reuse, less waste. Mori is a returnable packaging system that helps companies get rid of single-use plastic. I know what you're thinking. What's wrong with recycling? To be honest, recycling is rubbish. 91% of all the plastic that comes into your home will never be recycled, and recycling rates are going down. OK, I know what you're thinking next. Compostable packaging, also rubbish, because people don't know what to do with it. Can I put it in my recycling bin? Does the council want it? Can I maybe compost it in my garden? I'm not really sure. I'll just put it in the general, in the general waste bin. The only truly sustainable option is to turn off the plastic tap. And that means returnable, reusable plastic. So, what's in the Mori system? First of all, there's our own flat pack reusable packaging. Each item has its own unique ID. And because it's flat pack, it's really easy for customers to post the packaging back to us in our prepaid 
reusable envelopes for free. I know what you're thinking. Will customers send the packaging back? Well, we've been testing the Mori system for the last six months with 50 paying customers, rewarding them for the speed of return rather than for how much they spend. And our return rates are close to 100%. But we want the act of returning packaging to be something that people really want to do. So we're building an app that rewards customers for returning with incentives, such as NFT tokens. So the more you return, the more you earn. And if you want to know more about NFTs, please ask me the question in the, for the Mentimeter. So we just won last week a 25,000 pound grant um, from a green tech fund. We're raising 250,000 pounds First of all, to produce our first batch of packaging, and then to build our customer app and our NFT reward system, and then to test the entire system with 20 customers, 20 clients, who are already waiting to join us. I now have seven seconds left, but we have seven years to save the planet. The clock is ticking, time is running out, but we can turn the plastic tap off today, now, in this room. Let's, together, make single-use packaging a thing of the past. Thank you. Okay, Claire, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and please do get your questions in using the... Uh, at the scanning code, QR code that was just on the screen, and uh, the Menti number, the code is 36610177. Uh, right, Claire, let's kick off with a question. What else is happening in reusable packaging? Actually, it's a very, very ripe sector. So there's an enormous amount of activity bubbling up on the surface, all to do with making the reusable packaging system work. So if you look at, for example, uh, the catering sector or the takeaway sector, there are companies like Juni or Collibox that are... Um, have got a returnable packaging that customers can return after they've ordered their takeaway. It gets taken and washed in a very special washing facility. There's companies doing that as well. And then returned back to the restaurants to be refilled. And then there are a number of um, different companies popping up in the e-commerce sector, particularly with reusable envelopes. So instead of your Amazon packaging where you throw your envelope away afterwards or your box away, you simply send it back and it, be, and it is reused another time. So there's quite a lot happening. I want to get through as many questions as possible, so let's uh, kick off with the next one, which is, uh, what is this packaging for and what uh, does it contain? What can it contain? So the packaging currently is for grocery shopping because we think if we can crack it for grocery shopping, then we can, it'll work for everything. So we're starting with dry goods, um, which means um, things like pasta or flour or rice. Those will be our, our first... Um, products that we'll be um, putting put in our packaging. And so uh, we'll move on gradually as our packaging improves and we're able to refine it. We'll move on to more complicated things. We call them sticky products like peanut butter or oil. So they will need slightly different types of packaging. Fantastic. OK. Uh, have we got time for any more questions? Yes. Uh, what is the material of the packaging we're using and how many times can it be used? OK, great question. So the plan is that the, the, the packaging will be made of polypropylene. Some of it will, will um, be silicon, depending on the, what it needs to contain. Um, and in order for it to neutralize the carbon impact, we need to reuse it at least five times. Um, but we plan that this packaging can be used up to a thousand times. Now, of course, until we've been out there testing it over a longer period of time, we don't really know how long it will survive. But you know, our real goal is that it should be used, usable a thousand times. Um, will your solution, no, let's ask another question, how will you scale this? Okay, so our initial plan is we're currently working with five pilot customers in one London borough, um, and those, those clients all have direct-to-consumer um, sales. So we're helping them deliver returnable packaging to their customers. As we scale, we begin working with um, different kinds of brands, with retailers, with, um, with bigger companies, uh, and we also have a, a very close liaison with some local councils. So we've had some sponsorships and funding 
from several um, London boroughs who are very interested in how this will help them reduce their waste burden. So we've, been, we've had support from Barnet Council, from the Mayor's Office, and also from the London Borough of Lambeth. Yes, will your solution require changes in behaviour? And if so, uh, how will you make it easy? Very important question for consumers. Okay, so this is really at the heart of what we're doing because this is about changing that final gesture from dropping something in the bin to putting it in an envelope and dropping it in the post. In the future, we will have drop-off points. We will have um, collection bins. So imagine now you have your plastic and your, your paper and your dry recyclables and maybe your compost bin. You will have a reusable bin as well. So we want to work with waste authorities to make sure that the waste, the, the reusable packaging can be collected along with all of your other waste. Um, and making it easy for them, as I said, we've been testing already, and it is so easy for them that some customers are even bringing the, the packaging back to us themselves. So there's a great kind of understanding that we need to eliminate this problem. And I think people really are relieved to find a way of not having that bin full of plastic waste at the end of the week. So making it easy for them will also include the incentives that we're providing. And um, the NFTs will, is something that we're very excited about, where we can also kind of bring together this idea, eliminate the notion of waste and associate that plastic as something that has value. And that value also has a cultural value because our NFTs will be connected to a, a number of cultural um, items so, yeah, nobody asked me the NFTs question, but that's... Not okay. yet. Do we have time for one more question? Is that time up? No. Well, if you do want to ask the NFTs question, Claire will be uh, around outside afterwards. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks Claire. to you. Thank you. OK, uh, moving on. We now invite Toby from Zero Bees up, who are developing a platform supply chain organisation to decarbonise through better data and collaboration. Welcome to Toby. Hi, I'm Toby, co-founder of Zero Bees. We're a tech platform that helps small and medium-sized businesses actively decarbonize through better data and collaboration. Today, we are in the decade of decarbonization. By the time my eldest daughter, who's eight, is sitting for her GCSEs, we need to have halved global greenhouse gas emissions. And the ambition is there. There's net zero targets everywhere, and regulation is following quickly. But fundamentally, today, net zero is broken. Corporate net zero targets are strategic and high level. They're based on aggregated data and then generics. And they're fundamentally disengaged from the value chain on which they rely. The problem with this is that 90% of a corporate's greenhouse gas emissions sit outside of its direct control. Engaging the long tail of their supply, suppliers is critical for them to meet their net zero commitments and for us to meet our climate ambitions. Zero B's mission is to engage and empower these supply chains through better data and collaboration. Collaboration because no one can achieve net zero in a silo and better data because through collection of primary data and sector specific knowledge, we can present our users specific, uniquely specific, and accurate recommendations and reduction plans. Critically, we're also affordable, which is a main barrier to SMEs decarbonizing today. What do our users experience when they are on our SaaS platform? First of all, they collect data. This is the DNA of their activities and their organization. We're doing a full organizational carbon footprint, and that requires data from service from suppliers from employees, from their purchase data, and from their pensions. We collect this through simple, easy to use integrations and through automatic outreach. Then our machine learning and our algorithm translates this data into uniquely specific results and actionable plans for reduction. Our users are already setting targets between five and 30% reduction in their first year and they're now working hard to, to achieve that before their next audit. At scale, we can then solve large enterprises' thorniest challenges around scope three. 
we can present them with a platform already populated with engaged and actively decarbonizing suppliers so that the enterprise just needs to monitor them and ensure that they're in line and on track to hit their net zero commitment. Today, we already have an MVP, and it's going into beta. We already have revenue from, client, from customers who are paying to use our prototype service. But this is just the start. Over the next five years, we want to realize an opportunity of nearly 50 million pounds revenue in year from a subscription SaaS platform on one side with SMEs and enterprise sales on the other. This is our team. I am biased, but I think we're awesome. Uh, I'm a sustainability strategist with a commercial background. My co-founder, Martin, is ex-CEO of Nutmeg, where he raised 90 million and exited. And Andrew, who's in the audience today, is our CTO. He's a serial CTO from two successful ex exits and a machine learning guru. To recap, zero B solves for net zero in complex supply chains. We already have revenue and an MVP in beta. The next 12 months for us is about further proving our product market fit and about um, ensuring that our machine learning approach is validated. Today, we're looking for partners and mentors to help us on that journey, a journey that starts with a pre-seed fundraise later this year. We are super excited about our mission to accelerate decarbonization through supply chains. Join us to make decarbonization possible for everyone. Thank you. Very well done to you. Right, uh, just a reminder, now is time to get those questions in, so please do kick off uh, with uh, one we've already got in, which is, what is your go-to market strategy, Toby? Thank you. Um, we have, our beachhead markets are media and IT, uh, food and beverage, and professional services, and all for different reasons, uh, mainly because they're either complex or they're underserviced today. And the way we're going to, um, to achieve this is it starts off with three prongs. We've got one, which is uh, kind of B2B sales, but through strategic partnerships, like uh, people like accountants, people who have access to SME networks. Uh, the second one is through aggregators. So today we have a partnership with a, a large, um, large multinational agency in the media sector who helps, uh, who helps us in, uh, get into their supply chain and their supply side. And the third way is the virality of our product. So every time we request supplier data for one of our users, uh, that supplier has three choices. They can go onto the platform, uh, they, could not, they could ignore it, they could go onto the platform and give data, or they could go onto the platform and go, I really understand why we need this, let's sign up. Uh, and a question in that asks, can you tell us a bit more about your MVP? Yep, um, I'd love to show it to anyone who wants to come and see us outside as well. Um, our MVP, we broke it down into three areas, which is uh, the data collection side, um, the results side, and then the, the calculations in the middle. But it's, it's basically it's, it's to fit with our beachhead markets. So it's got um, sector-specific data collection in there for things like media units. Um, but it is around the, uh, the, the, what we've experienced through our prototype uh, customer demands to, to fit for their needs. Another question in that asks, what level of data can you collect? Yeah, we are Scope 3 specialists, so we do collect Scope 1 and 2, um, but that's uh, really, you know, that, that's the bread and butter piece in the middle. Scope 3 is really where we spend our time and effort. So we're about collecting data from, uh, from supply chain, like material supply chain pieces uh, for the user, uh, from, their, uh, from their employees, for working from home, from pensions and investments, um, or from the way they deploy their digital ads, for example, in the media sector. Um, why are you bees? That's a good question. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So it's uh, the original thinking, although it's taken on a few minutes since, was uh, the zero bit was for net zero, and the bees is because we do all the work, all the heavy lifting for you. So we're trying to, the, the core of our product is trying to be super easy to overcome one of the other issues for SMEs, which is time, accessibility, and, and you know, where to start. So we're trying to really simplify how they collect their data and work through. Uh, another question in that asks, what kind of clients do you have at the moment? Um, so our customers so far are, um, a lot of them are from the media sector. That was our, our, our first um, uh, kind of deep sector movement. Uh, we've also, we've got some um, NGO customers today. Uh, we also have, we've had an F, a food and beverage uh, customer um, and professional services as well. Uh, who is your ideal mentor? Um, I think so. We, we, I think we know what we don't know, which is you know, quite a lot. Um, so there's a lot of it around um, enterprise sales. Is something that um, 
that is something that would be great for us. Uh, partnerships and building up those partnerships and, and networking, just trying to get to, uh, from something that's a SaaS product, um, you know, really scaling that. So it's, it's all about how to, that kind of go to market and building that and supporting our thinking through it. Okay, um, just time for a few more, I think. What makes you different from others who are trying to provide similar services? Yeah, um, so we, gosh, we look at the competitive marketplace in here. It's, I mean, it's quite crowded, right? There's, there's quite a few people out there doing things around decarbonization and scope three. Uh, but we break them into three areas. One is um, the two expensive categories. So the consultants and the platforms out there who are, who are targeting enterprise or really large organizations um, where they can get a decent amount of revenue for every, every sale. Uh, so they're too expensive for SMEs. Then we've got um, the, the ones we call too good to be true, which is uh, API integrators who do something very snazzy, very tech, very, very simple. Um, it takes five minutes, but then they lead you off into carbon offsetting. So there's no decarbonization at all in that process. And then you've got the ones which are too generic. So they're aiming at SMEs, but the, the data levels today, they, they, they're pretty quite good for one, two, three person organizations, but they don't really dig into the specif specifics of an organization who's doing anything more than just a bit of office work. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end of the questions, but thank you for a great range of questions and thank you for putting it on. Uh, okay, so that brings us to the final pitch of this section, um, and I'd like to welcome Paul from Deploy, uh, who are disrupting the construction industry uh, by developing water management infrastructure using more environmentally friendly materials. Please welcome Paul. Thank you. And yes, break is coming soon, so uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so my name is Paul. And when I was eight years old, my dad took me to a small rural community to celebrate their new water system that he helped them build. That event marked my life, and I've dedicated my career to water access initiatives, including a case study of more than 170 communities in South America. In every water supply system, the most challenging and expensive element is the water storage unit. It's massive and combined with the water challenges that the water management challenge due to climate change, like uh, droughts, floods, and deadly wildfires, it becomes overwhelming. We are Deploy, providing affordable and sustainable water storage solutions. Deploy is the first ever foldable concrete container. It's packed in a standard pallet. It's air deployed, and once it reaches its final shape, it's hydrated to harden the material and then it will be ready to use in just 24 hours. So thanks to our material, combined with a thorough structural analysis, we have been able to replace 150 millimeter wall thickness with just six millimeters. Our beachhead market is agriculture here in the UK, but our potential to scale is massive, starting from drinking water systems, a worldwide need, but also fire mitigation, the most dangerous effects of climate change today. Um, in the US alone, 40 million people live in high risk fire areas. The demand to comply with forest fire legislation and to protect their homes makes it our biggest market. We compete with conventional concrete and plastic tanks, and we use the best properties of concrete and plastic in one smart solution. Deploy fits in a pickup truck, and it's half the price of conventional concrete. It's more durable than plastic, and the best option for maintenance convenience. Varen, Tony, Jacob, and I are in the driving seat. Accompanied by experts in concrete infrastructure, business strategy, um, commercial operations, and fire suppression as well. So we uh, have created a massive network, uh, filed a patent, raised over a million pounds in investment, and obtained exposure from influential media as well. But the most validating traction was from the Minister of Colombia, requesting 200 tanks for earthquake survivor villages. The construction industry is one of the toughest sectors to decarbonize due to the overwhelming use of conventional concrete. But we're developing technology to make more eco-friendly infrastructure. We generate 70% less CO2 in our material choices, 90% less CO2 in transportation, and we use 75% less water in our uh, processes. So 
we believe that our technology is going to help and it's going to contribute to the enormous task of making the construction industry greener and better. Thank you. Right, time now for uh, the final round of questions in this section. Uh, well done on a brilliant pitch. Uh, we'll start with one that asks, why is your product better than plastic or uh, metal water tanks? Yeah, so um, something that we have, are been trying to really streamline is something about transportation. Uh, transportation is one of the massive kind of contributors to, to uh, pollution. Uh, and with our technology, we're able to not just reach extreme locations, but reach from a uh, very uh, centralized point, different areas around the world. So we're making it uh, be able to uh, deploy large infrastructure viable uh, from here, from the UK to either uh, Africa or South America in a more cost efficient way and also considering the, the transportation issues of that, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Another question asks, what's your uh, business model? Are you looking to produce the product or will you license it? So that is the bless and the course of our product. So we're developing our own manufacturing uh, facility, uh, which makes it very cool because we are hardcore engineers, so we love doing that. Uh, and the other problem is that it's very capital intensive. So uh, it's cool that we are be able to make something compact that then we can also, our plan is to replicate these, these factories in strategic areas. One of them probably it's Turkey because our co-founder is in Turkey. Uh, which we would cover a large area with, with that then. So that's our plan of how we're going to scale. And obviously, we are in part of our business plan is we find distributors to deliver and sell our tanks. We uh, focus mainly in the, in the manufacturing, and then with those partnerships, we reach our, our final customers. Yeah. Okay, brilliant stuff. Uh, another question asks, uh, what will your business model be? Will you, uh, that's the question you just answered. Let's uh, move on to the next one, which is, uh, how long may a deploy container last and can it be recycled? Oh, this is very exciting. So, um, so yeah, uh, uh, we guarantee a lifespan of 20 years, but actually the material itself has a, a, a lifespan of 120 years guarantee. So that is where the recycling and the repurposing comes in. So since it's a concrete-based material, it has other opportunities to be reused for. So we're working uh, in our design kind of uh, side, we're working on how we can repurpose this. And in this area, all the farmers and people in the rural area are very handy and very skillful. So for example, the, we're designing how to line a ditch or how to do erosion protection with the material that comes from the tank so it can also not just uh, after its lifespan, it can be reused for another purpose as well. Uh, what are you looking for uh, in <coughs> the way of, that question is just flipped, let's see if we can go back to it. Okay, how can you scale the company? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so we're very lucky uh, that, uh, that we're working with this material. So we are launching actually our first uh, kind of product, which is just a concrete slab, trying to replace the conventional concrete slabs. And we want to uh, try to invest all our revenue within our company. And we believe that with the way we're developing our manufacturing, which is a manufacturing line that is very compact and uh, very easy to replicate in different areas where uh, maybe uh, the accessibility for manufacturing must, it might not be as, as, as good as here in the UK. So that is the way to scale up. And also focusing on the markets that really make sense for us. So for example, uh, worldwide, one of, of our biggest markets we're getting a lot of traction is from the U.S., from the West Coast, to protect the, all those fire, uh, fire areas that are in danger right now. And part of this is uh, we already have funding for, for that project from Innovate UK. We won the SMART grant recently for uh, half a million, so we're going for that, really focusing strategically wh which markets we, we, we can um, uh, exploit more. Yeah. Well, on that point, a question just come in asking what you're looking for, what is the ask? The ask is we want uh, very strong partnerships with people because uh, right now we have uh, we want to take this knowledge that we have built here in the UK and start to uh, deploy it around, first of all, Europe and different areas. So uh, very, specific, very good partnerships, um, business propositions that can be uh, um, uh, executed, and you know finding those pipelines that 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 we can that we can start leveraging from. Stuff. 
Um, I think that brings us to the end of our questions. So well done, Paul. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Um, it is almost time now for a break, but before we do that, let me just say a big thank you to all of the innovators. It's uh, not easy to get up in front of you and pitch their brilliant ideas. They've all done a brilliant job. Um, I'd like to ask before we take a break, just for you all to take a, a few minutes to uh, score what you've just seen from the teams and to do so, just head to menti.com again. Uh, that's the QR code and that's the uh, code that you can put in if you need it, 36610177. We have four more brilliant startups uh, preparing to share with you their pictures in just a moment's time. Before we do so, um, I'd like to introduce you and invite our next uh, speaker up. Uh, welcome uh, to the stage, please welcome to the stage, James Cameron, who is an award-winning leader uh, in the global climate change movement, an advocate and catalyst uh, for galvanising big impact change on environmental challenges globally, and, and as a barrister has over uh, 30 years of experience working across, uh, across a wide range of sectors, making him uniquely placed to advise on the complex challenges that hinder uh, progress on more sustainable futures, and someone that you, uh, many of you, I think, already know. James, welcome. Well, good afternoon, and welcome, welcome back from the break. What a brilliant session we just, just had, how inspiring is it to see all those ideas uh, becoming real? Okay, so following on from what Alyssa said earlier, we have a really complex systems problem. Uh, we have interrelated, overlapping, compounding, aggravating problems within that system too. Securities, water, energy, peace and security, food security, all interconnected. That's the context for all of this innovation. And yes, we are under time pressure. And in the middle of all of that, we're at war. And we have huge pressure to think differently about pretty much everything, including our economic system and how we value things and whether we should value natural capital as much as we value other forms of capital. And under huge pressure, generally, our societies respond creatively. There is a relationship between the kind of pressure that makes you feel really threatened and the kind of innovation that makes you break free, free of the constraints that you feel under. And that, I think, is where we are at the moment. I'm feeling really rather energized by the possibility that we might be entering a kind of renaissance where these are such severe threats that we rethink lots of stuff that matters. And that renaissance will appear in science and in technology and in the arts. And increasingly, I'm interested in the connection between these different types of creativity. I'd like this place to be one of the places you come to see that connection, to be excited about the possibility of reimagining the world. That's the context, I think, for what you're seeing here today. There's no prospect of resolving these conflicts, of finding the right intervention points in a system change without thinking differently. And then once the thoughts have emerged, once the ideas are present, how do we do the doing? How do we finance that? We're gonna, we're gonna need innovation in finance too. Even basic concepts, rates of return and the expectations that investors have about what value they're delivering, these are gonna need to be thought through, challenged, reinvented. But I thought I would just say three things to the entrepreneurs in the room. From my own experience, but also what I hope is experienced by many in other walks of life. The first is people focus just as much on the people, on who you work with, who you choose to build your enterprise with, the little societies you're building. Choose the people well. Keep the relationships, even if things go wrong as they will, even if you have relationships that go sour, keep the connection. Build strong, resilient relationships. They will look after you and your interest and your ideas over time. Second, purpose does help. Having purpose does help. There's a little bit of a backlash about that at the moment, a little bit of skepticism about whether it really adds value. Purpose does help, but it's not enough. 
the mission isn't enough. You've got to deliver on all sorts of other levels. You've got to satisfy people who may not be fully with your purpose. They've got other metrics. That's a challenge. But in the end, it's up to you to decide what your purpose is. Nobody else. And the third, from long experience, is never give up. Persevere. I went to see, many of you may also have seen a brilliant play called Jerusalem. There's a tremendous character in that play, a character called Rooster. It's probably one of the best acting performances I've ever seen. But right at the end, he has a very profound conversation with his estranged young son. And he says essentially those things to him in a mad and chaotic ending. He says, don't let anybody else define who you are and never give up. Never, never give up. Perseverance is a hugely important asset for all entrepreneurs, but particularly if you have a mission, particularly if you think you are part of a community of problem solvers, that you are actually trying to use whatever resources you have, personal and the financial and technological ones you've assembled around you, to solve any part of this really complex problem, this systems problem we face. So let me just leave that there and look forward to the next presentations from these entrepreneurs and, and offer service to those ideas. One of the things I hope we can do through the Center for Climate Change Innovation is build a, a community of people who perhaps, like me, have some experience who can be in service to the generation of entrepreneurs that you see today because that's the proper attitude for those of my generation to have some care and interest in the generations that follow. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, thank you so much, James. And that brings us on to uh, the next round of really exciting pictures for you to hear from. Uh, to start with, I'd like to uh, welcome OSAS to uh, give you your pitch, uh, kicking off this second section with the founder of Deep Meta, uh, transforming the metals industry with AI for a more sustainable future. So, Osas, over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Osas Amorgede, PhD in steel metallurgy, a metal scientist, and founder of Deep Meta, an AI software to predict production defects in metals and we are starting with steel. I invite you all to take a moment to reflect. How did you arrive here today? Where are you going home to? What are you gonna pick up when you have dinner this evening? <laughs> the truth is, we live in a world that is built on steel. It is the most used engineering metal in the world, and unsurprisingly, it's responsible for almost 10% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. But the insight is in yield losses, which cause up to a quarter of steel to be unusable, meaning that with better optimized processes, much of these emissions could be avoided. Steel producers currently generate vast amounts of data, but frequently use these in isolation to identify whether temperature is too high in one part of production or whether the rolling speed is too low in another. Deep Meta instead exploits this as a big data problem by analyzing thousands of variables simultaneously. I would like to show you Deep Meta in action. Our models analyze data from multiple stages of production to predict future outcomes based upon historical events. And this has the opportunity to have an incredible impact on how metals are made today. We are tackling this problem by tackling yield loss caused by defects. When you have a defect, say a crack in a large steel slab, for example, it can no longer be sold. It either needs to be reworked or remelted which takes a great deal of time, requires more energy, and increases carbon emissions. Deep Meta instead 
provides actionable recommendations to operators, enabling them to make steel right first time. This has the combined benefits of improving productivity, lowering costs, and also reducing the embodied carbon in the steel itself. Because of this, we are working with some of the world's largest steel producers to develop predictive algorithms based on real production data. And to date, we have access to five years of production data and have proven this technology in half of the major steel production stages. Now, this has the potential at scale to reduce carbon emissions by 15 to 20 percent caused um, by issues caused by yield loss. And to achieve this potential, we have raised over half a million pounds from amazing investors, including Google, to launch in our beachhead market, the UK steel industry. And as part of our go-to market strategy, we have built strategic partnerships across the entire value chain, starting from Molten Steel in Production with the Materials Processing Institute, which has a steel pilot plan enabling us to deploy and develop our product rapidly and at low cost, to Spartan, one of the largest steel re-rollers in the United Kingdom and supplier of construction steel, all the way through to an end user in construction, Grosvenor, a 340-year-old pioneer in property development. When you step outside this afternoon, you will see some of their buildings. And they have incredibly ambitious net zero targets, making these organizations the ideal partners for Deep Meta. We are now actively hiring and are also looking for mission-driven advisors who have domain knowledge in these areas or expertise in enterprise software to join us to save the world one ton at a time. Right, you can uh, now return to the uh, Menti website to ask your questions. And uh, just a heads up before we start with those questions, you will not see other people's questions, so don't be confused if you've put one in and you're not seeing anything. We are getting them. Uh, we will put them through. And if you don't get the chance to do so, you'll get the chance to speak to uh, the startups outside afterwards. Let's get on with the questions. So, first question up, will you need to install new sensors? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, conveniently, no. Um, and that's because... Uh, since the 1990s or so, steel plants um, for many places around the world have been very well instrumented. And what that means is they have these sensors at the key parts of their production lines. Um, so they're already gathering this data. Okay. Uh, we have another question, I think. Uh, let's see. Yes, we do. Uh, can this be used in any other kind of steel plants? Okay. Uh, so there are two main production routes, um, which is like the blast furnace route or the electric arc furnace route. Um, and we've worked with both. So we're led to believe that it can work in any kind of production route. As for the various stages of production um, involved in steel, we think that um, there is going to be a lot of applicability. Um, so eventually, at every stage, right now, we're, we're halfway there, but we definitely are getting there. Okay. Let's see, we have another question. Then. What kind of recommendations does your system provide to uh, operators? So there are two ways to think about this. Um, the first way is um, detective. So we tell them things that have happened. And then the second is predictive. So the detective is helpful because um, it allows them to save time on trying to solve problems, so i.e. trying to identify where the issues are. So we will be able to identify a location that they need to check. Um, the second is predictive, which is far more exciting. And that's where we get into material loss avoidance and also carbon emissions avoidance. Uh, and that's where we provide recommendations as to what parameters they need to use on their production lines to actually avoid the defect altogether. Okay, and uh, just time for one more. How quickly are you able to adapt to changes in processes? Okay, really, really good. Um, so the way that we're thinking about this problem right now is that we are training on historical data um, and because steel is made in batches, we are able to run a machine learning model um, based upon a, a current production line, um, however, not using any of that existing data. 
So we won't necessarily need to have a very fast feedback loop, which is important because uh, much of our customers are not currently on the cloud. And so we have to find um, innovative ways to get around the data management and, ing and in ingestion problem. Um, so yeah, that's currently the approach that, that we're taking. Um, and I think we do have time for just one more. We yeah, do. Sure. Yes. Can this be used with other metals or materials or just exclusively for steel? OK. So as I said at the beginning of my, my talk today, uh, we're starting with steel. Uh, so the exciting thing is that there are other metals which have quite similar processes. So there's going to be quite a lot of transferability. Examples of those are metals like aluminum and copper, um, which also have rolling processes, which are quite similar to steel. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Thank you very much. OK, uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Andy from Angry Monk, an initiative which is answering the problem of food waste. Andy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Andy, and I'm a co uh, I am a co-founder of Angry Monk. In the UK right now, we grow and produce 30% of our food. We import 70% of it, but we're wasting up to 40% of it. This is a huge problem that we wanted to address. So Angry Monk rescues, pardon me, Angry Monk rescues surplus and irregular produce and sells that on to catering companies restaurants and businesses at a profit. We started our journey in August last year, and in March this year, we launched our B2B service, and we're already working with three of the four largest catering companies in the world, with a combined turnover of 32 billion pounds. Our unit economics are positive, and we also have a letter of intent for £1.3 million worth of procurement spend from a single client. So the Angry Monk team and I have a wonderful problem at the moment. We can't currently meet the demand that we have for our business. I have businesses signing up to work with us in our core, in our core area of operations, which is London. And I also have businesses signing up on a waiting list to work with us outside of London and in the wider UK. So I'm here today to talk to you about what we need. Right now, we are looking for investment in the coming months that will allow us to scale our operations and meet this demand, and also build our own tech platform, well, build on our own tech platform, that will allow our customers to order and work with Angry Monk Surplus with ease, but also allow us to have suppliers sign up and provide us with their surplus so that much less food, and in fact, if we can eliminate it, any food going to landfill. People are hungry, pardon the pun, to work with Angry Monk and our produce, and we're looking for passionate people that feel as, well, not angry, but that they, we, <laughs> we're looking for people that feel as passionately as we do about food waste, and we welcome your investment and any opportunity for mentorship as we look to address this problem. Because it is, isn't it crazy that we w waste more food than we grow? Together we can change that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think we're going to welcome your co-founder, Nathan, to yes. answer some questions as well. So Nathan, welcome along. Uh, right, let's uh, start with the questions coming in. What made you decide uh, to set up, uh, to start Angry Monk? So um, I was living with a monk uh, for a month, eating only cabbage. Um, and one day he took me out for an all-you-can-eat meal. And there I couldn't finish my third plate. At which point the monk suddenly flipped and became really angry. Essentially wouldn't let me leave until the plate was lit clean. And so coming back to the UK, my co-founder told me that for Every two plates of food we eat in the UK, there's an entire third plate that is lost in the supply chain. And so this salient contrast really led us to founding Angry mm -hmm. Monk to eradicate and eliminate that third plate as well. Okay, so an actual Angry Monk is behind it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It exists. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see if we're having questions coming in. We are. Uh, what uh, kind of surplus have you been working with? 
right now, it's fruit and veg. And uh, the list is comprehensive and scary, the amount of surplus that we have. You have a wide range of vegetables and fruit that absolutely nothing wrong with it. We just have too much of it. So it's going straight to landfill. Um, next question in asks, how does your system work? Yes, yeah, so um, currently we work with wholesalers um, across the London area. Uh, we pool the surplus that they have uh, either because of imperfect appearance or because they sort of have poor stock management or simply have a hard time predicting the demand that they are going to have that fluctuates according to the weather, for example. So we work with those wholesalers, pool their supply, and then um, send out uh, weekly updates to our catering clients um, so that's companies that run the canteens at um, these tech offices, law firms, universities. Um, we have a list of produce they can use and include in their menus week on week. And so, yeah, um, that's how it works. And then we find that ultimately um, sort of staff members of the offices and students at the universities really enjoy um, feeling that the food that they eat really has the biggest impact on the world it can. Yeah. Are you working uh, with farmers yeah. directly? That's a great question. So at the moment, we're not. So we will be. Um, we've actually just brought someone into the team who's got 20 years of experience in food chain supply at wholesalers and pack houses and farmers. So bringing that level of expertise into the business is going to allow us to start working with them directly. The sooner that we can switch to that with money, um, the sooner that we can um, <laughs> try to increase our profits and increase our impact. How do you ensure the freshness and quality of the food for resale? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So um, the food that often we purchase um, is produce that's totally fine. Simply the pack house that sort of has imported it or has it sort of transferred from the grow knows that it can't shift it. And so it's perfectly fresh and quality produce. Simply the demand across the existing book of clients of that pack house or that wholesaler um, simply can't satisfy the stock levels they have. So, you know, the, the suppliers we work with send us fresh produce, and in the early days, we check for that, but, you know, so far, no accidents. So, we phase that pretty soon. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, how are you making money? What's the business model? Sure. So, when we rescue that produce, um, it is coming in an average of 16% cheaper than if you'd conventionally buy that from as, as, a, um, as a restaurant or a catering business. But we're able to make anything between sort of 40, 40 to 50 percent margins on average with that produce when we sell it on. So there's margins in everything that we sell that we make take the profit out of. Thank you very okay. much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, next up I'd like to welcome Oithen from EvaTrack, which is developing intelligent software solutions to create a better uh, charging network for electric cars. Over to you, Oithen. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Today I will be talking about the future of our uh, charging infrastructure for electric cars. Um, how many of you have a car and drove today? Just Show of hands, just a quick poll. And how many of you have an electric car? Okay. So for you electric car drivers, this is what you're constantly looking for. An accessible charging station available uh, to, to go there, charge now, when you need, and where you need it. For others who do not drive an electric car, this will be also your future desire. Today in the UK, we have 30,000 public charging points for you to go there and charge. And in um, about 10 years, we'll have uh, nine times more than that, over a quarter of a million of them. And this investment uh, will reach up to 18 billion pounds in total. In Europe, we'll have a similar story, but much, much bigger growth. Uh, by 2030, the infrastructure will be about 12 times larger than what we have today. So the expansion will be huge. And this new public infrastructure will help us achieve our climate goals for road transportation. The key is where to put all these chargers and um, when to deploy them in those spots. This is what EvoTruck is going to answer. At EvoTruck, 
we are building a software technology for charging providers. We call it EvoCast. And it will be able to tell you where and when should a charger be placed in any city around the world. And let me tell you why that's important. Currently, we have limited charging options publicly available, uh, but this will drastically change. Companies are racing each other to build as many stations as possible. But having a large network on its own will not ensure a convenient and um, easy access to charging spots. At EvoTrack, we're trying to change this. We are using at, um, advanced computational techniques to pick the right location so each charger will be convenient and accessible for drivers and highly used at each instance. This will make sure that we don't have a large network only for the sake of it, but we have the right size that we need. Um, in fact, using EvoCast, we want to help reducing the tar future charging network by 5% or more. And only in the UK, this will help saving 1 billion pounds of investment in the next 10 years. But more importantly, it will reduce the material and the car carbon footprint of the whole charging ecosystem. Our solution is superior because of our advanced intelligent forecast engine we have been developing the past few years. And this engine characterizes different key differentiators <laughs> that we need to understand the system. Looking at power networks, the urban infrastructure, the layout of the roads, um, the use of the buildings, and um, external weather events. Using machine learning and other software solutions, this engine is able to predict the best placement for different networks. Using our web-based uh, services, then our clients can access these decisions, decisions on demand and according to their needs. We have a passionate team to make this happen. Uh, we have a diverse set of talents, all experts in their fields, and all critical to deliver this product on a timely manner. Uh, currently, we are developing our prototype to be ready by this September. Um, and the, the key for us is to accelerate this development so we can shape the infrastructure. So to be able to fully commercialize our technology by 2024, we are inviting investments of 450,000 pounds. This will help us hire other key team members and deliver this product to the stakeholders that we are in uh, touch constantly. Um, we have an ambitious plan, but it can transform the infrastructure for the better. And um, if, if you think this is a worthwhile effort, you can join us and we can make sure the frustration of not finding a charger when you need and where you need a thing of the past. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I would just ask that you uh, get those questions in using menti.com uh, now if you can and uh, use the uh, QR code that you saw up there if you need it. Uh, so first question, in, where do you get the data that you need? So uh, we use a mix of public and private data sets, but we try to use open source wherever we can. Um, it really depends on the infrastructure that we're talking about uh, because we are looking at different layers of um, urban systems. And for instance, like e easy um, example is maybe weather data. You would have a lot of public information. And for the powered networks, it's a bit more tricky. There we work with our collaborators and partners to get the data we need. Okay. Uh, do we have another question in? Let's see. Yes, we do. How do you define uh, the right location as new electric car users uh, come in uh, and as they are ch there are changes in residential areas, surely the right location will change with it? Exactly. And that's actually the power of our engine in a way, because the city itself is a living matter. So in 10 years, it may look completely different, especially in, in developing regions of the world. So that's why we look at uh, several layers that are driving the need uh, for demands. Here, close to this building, we have more uh, commercial buildings, um, shopping centers. So the demand for charging is completely different than in a residential area. So that's why we are looking ahead of time and planning not just for tomorrow, but for five years and for 10 years spans. That's kind of the um, selling point of our software as well, actually. Uh, can you tell us more about the forecasting technology, somebody asks? 
Uh, I would be happy to, because I have been uh, doing research on it for a very long time. Um, well, the short answer is it, it deploys certain machine learning techniques as well as uh, learning from patterns, from um, infrastructure use. So uh, the traffic information that we have in the city, how the uh, traffic changes from external weather events, uh, how the charging access changes, how the city layout is changing. And all these patterns are fed into our, our learning technology. And that will give us uh, kind of the ideal sets under different conditions. The important thing is to uh, understand one answer is never good for infrastructure because there's always a lot of trade-offs. So then we kind of pack these trade-offs and give it to the charging providers to decide what is the uh, ideal selection for them. Okay, brilliant. Um, another question in asks, how do you validate that the charging points are placed in the best places? Yes, that's another good question. Uh, we are very lucky because since we started this uh, venture, actually the charging uh, space grew so much. So we were able to actually see what happens. <laughs> So when we make our decisions, we are constantly comparing uh, our past decisions against what happens and how these stations have been successful or uh, underperforming. So we're actually able to test just because the charging space, space is growing. Uh, so we're benchmarking against real data right now against the decisions that we made. Okay, um, another question asks, are you already working in any other cities? Yes, so uh, we are working in London uh, as a start. Uh, it's a great uh, place because there's so much data flow and uh, so much uh, charging infrastructure happening right now. And that will be where our first prototype is going to target. Once we benchmark and validate our technology, then we will be opening up to other cities in the UK and then Europe and then the rest of the world. One more question. I think we don't know. Oh, we don't. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, which brings us to the uh, final pitch in this section. And please welcome Deb from ESG Base, uh, who offer a range of data analytics and advisory solutions to help the financial industry achieve more positive environmental, social, and governance outcomes. Over to you. Hi, I'm Dev, co founder and CEO of ESG Base. At ESG Base, our mission is simple to make ESG alignment easy our entire suite of technologies and tools, the methodologies we have developed, all serve this one common purpose. To meet the Paris Agreement climate targets, the market for green real asset investment needs to grow to seven trillion US dollars. Currently, that market is one trillion, so we're expecting a six-fold increase in this decade. It's essential these funds are deployed wisely. The due diligence process for green real asset investment requires specialized ESG consultants that are both currently expensive and time-consuming. Because of the time and cost constraints, people only use these services for high-profile projects, leaving a large number of projects open to greenwashing and subsequent risk of litigation and reputational damage. Our technology standardizes and productizes the same work process as a team of specialized consultants would undertake providing a highly scalable, cost-effective, and dramatically faster alternative. Our technology takes into account scientific and engineering parameters of the real assets, such as build material and use case, and produces bottom-up, science-based, forward-looking predictive analysis of the ESG credentials of the real assets. This past year, we have been working with various clients in private equity, infrastructure funds, banks, and government policy organizations, helping them navigate toward more ESG-aligned and net-zero portfolio and economy. Our key deliveries include due diligence, reporting, carbon accounting and goal setting, ESG risks and impact assessment, and valuation of assets. We have been selected by the G20's Global Infrastructure Hub as one of the top 10 disruptive technologies enabling sustainable and resilient infrastructures. We were selected by the Accenture FinTech Innovation Lab as one of the top three sustainability-focused FinTechs from an application pool of over 250 startups. Our other supporters include London Business School, the University of Cambridge, Santander Bank, and uh, the European Regional Development Fund, 
and of course, the Grantham Institute. We know that you're here today because you care about a more sustainable future. We invite you to collaborate with us, to partner with us, to accelerate your ESG journey. Together, let us propel your portfolio to the next level of ESG alignment. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you. Very well done, Dev. Um, can I ask anyone for long? Uh, can I ask uh, any questions to start posting them into uh, the uh, Menti website now? And we start with one that asks: How does a typical client use your product? Hi, I'm Nick Rhodes, uh, co-founder of ESG Base. Um, well, typically, uh, as Dev said, there's a suite of technologies, a broad range, very powerful uh, platform. So. Typical is perhaps uh, a difficult word to use because everyone is atypical with their needs. Um, we work a lot with uh, large financial institutions, uh, governments, and uh, we've done a lot of work with US private equity. Um, so the way we're able to help people is, is, is basically we identify their needs specifically and we are powerful enough to basically answer all of their ESG data questions. So that can be uh, a screening process, due diligence, uh, we can build financial models that put their assets real or, or proposed um, under these stresses, and we can model the finances and work out if they're going to work or not. Okay, brilliant. Uh, another question in asks, what does ESG stand for? Who asked that? <laughs> <laughs> Environmental, social, and governance. So it's a very broad range, enormous, in fact. And I don't know if you read the Financial Times, but the FT seems to have a very... Uh, Difficult um, understanding of how specific these things are. Uh, some people that we talk to are kind of negative. Can this be measured? Uh, essentially, you can measure anything. And so the S and the G, we get a lot of discussions about, can that really be measured and can it be changed? And um, environmental and the environment are, are kind of what most people are interested in at the moment. And the S and the G, because they're difficult to understand, and difficult to measure, people kind of step back and perhaps say, oh, let's not worry about this. But you can measure something and you can't change what you can't measure. So... If you have any data and you're able to use that for your uh, predictions and your growth patterns and your investments and your idea of the future, then that is actually a benefit. And those are the, the three things that we should all be focusing on in terms of uh, building a better, more resilient uh, future. Okay, brilliant description of ESG. Uh, another question that asks, ESG covers a large and complicated set of parameters, as you just said, and each component can differ per industry. So how do you normalise to make the outputs easier to use? Yeah, normalization is perhaps not the way you should look about it because you don't, to get the best results for what you're going to be doing, it needs to be specific. It can't, you can't just have a normalized response. There is a, a reporting understanding. I mean, no one needs more reporting parameters, as I'm sure many of you know. But we can, and you can all, find exactly the, uh, the specifics that you need to be able to create the best change. Um, Normalize, we can, we can respond to requests from clients. Can you help us with these investor requests? Can you help us with these ratings? Can you help us with etc.? But to get the really most powerful impact, you, you need to specialize and focus down deep into the data of what you're doing. And it's all about data. If you miss, if you miss something specific, it can have a big shift on the impact and the, uh, the positive effect. So perhaps normalization should be changed to more, something more specific. Okay. Uh, another question in asks, is your software a standalone product or is it integrated with other software and why? Uh, well, it can be integrated. It, it, it's standalone in the sense that we, we built it and um, it, it functions very well. It's attached to one of the most powerful backends on the planet and that comes with it a great power. Uh, if you have a software system that it needs to be integrated into, yeah, we can do that. Um, and... Prior to that, if you're at the stage where you need help with kind of strategy and consulting around your systems, we're also able to do that. And then we'll just embed in or, or work separately. Okay. Just one thing to add there is that yeah, the software is embedded in the cloud. So somebody who is trying to use it through the cloud can do it directly. It is also uh, accessible through, uh, uh, say, API Connect. So if somebody opens to, uh, wants to open up a port and get information uh, from our portal, there, there are those possibilities as well. Okay, that brings us to the end of the questions. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, well done to all of the second round of uh, startups who, if you would like to speak to in more detail outside and find out anything you didn't get the chance to question, will be outside during this next uh, break. Uh, before we uh, take this break, can I ask you to uh, go back to menti.com uh, using uh, the code and the QR code here uh, to score each of the teams that you have seen uh, throughout this second uh, set of innovators. And just a reminder of the three areas that we're asking you to score based on a commercial potential, climate impact and quality of the pitch that you've seen. I'd like to welcome uh, the Head of Corporate Sustainability at HSBC UK to share reflections and uh, tell us why HSBC UK are uh, supporting the greenhouse. So please join me in welcoming Michaela Wright. I've not had my instructions, so I'm assuming it's the mic. Um, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and it's just so great to be here today. I, I've listened to four of the um, startups already and just completely inspired and, and just great to see the range. So um, just a little bit about HSBC and, and our support for this program. So um, we, we actually uh, launched this program nearly a year ago today. Um, so that's with Imperial College London and University of Birmingham. And the aim is to support over 150 startups um, to help scale those startups and hopefully some of them internationally as well because we're, we're an international um, bank. Um, we know that climate change uh, is not going to be solved just by reducing emissions and we, we know that we need more innovations to be able to do that. So this is part of a wider global program for HSBC. So we have our climate solutions program globally that we, we run with WWF and WRI and so pleased that this imperial program is, is also part of that program. And we, we heard from James in the first half about the systemic change that's required. And for us in HSBC, we recognize that. And we are going through a transformational change right now. So we've set out our net zero commitments. Um, we've set those out for our balance sheet, um, as well as our operations and supply chain. And, you know, some people say, oh, 2050 target, that's a long way away. We are now setting nearer term targets for sectors like oil and gas and, and power and utilities. And we plan to set out our whole transition plan in um, 20, no, at the end of this year. So, so we will have a more detailed plan at, at the end of this year about how we're going about that. But it is a, a huge transformation. But we, we recognize as part of that plan that the biggest impact we can have as a global bank is supporting our clients to transition. And that's over 90% when you think about the emissions of a bank. It's not the supply chain, it's not our operation, it's our client and investment activities. Um, but to do that, innovation has to pay, play a key role. So it's absolutely inspiring to be supporting Imperial and this accelerator program that, that that we fund with Imperial. And I know that through Naveed and all the team, they provide you with the mentoring support and the connections that you also need for your, for your businesses. So, so I just, just a little reminder that we still need lots more innovation. We know, we know based on a recent UN report that, you know, with the government targets as well as business targets, we are heading towards 2.7 degrees. Um, and and we, we all know to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to be... Actually, we'd rather not get to 1.5, but, but it, you know, we need to be at least at that 1.5. So we're a way off, which is why it's so important you, you keep pushing your innovations um, because I know that in this room we'll have some big solutions to that systemic change that, that James talked about. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm really looking forward. I think it's another four um, we've got to listen to. Yes, I'm getting a nod. So, so really looking forward to the next sec section and, and thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, as McKelly says, that is correct. We have uh, four more to come and I want to uh, get onto them as quickly as possible. But just a reminder, please do have uh, Menti ready to uh, get those questions in after each pitch. So next up, we have a Honeycomb Network, creating the smartest infrastructure necessary for a clean transport future. Uh, and for that, please welcome Gabriel. How did you get here today? I came on my personal electric scooter, and my journey was cheap, clean, cheap, and convenient. But I haven't just left it here as a prop. There actually isn't anywhere for me to store or charge it. Private e-scooters are the future of clean urban transport, yet so far, our cities fail to support them. I'm Gabriel, CEO of Honeycomb Network, and we're establishing a network of smart charging locker pods for private e-scooters. Road transport contributes 11% of all global emissions. Private e-scooters are a clean, cheap, and convenient alternative to short car journeys, which make up 70% of all trips. In France, there are already 2.5 million private e-scooter owners, but Guess how many places there are to store or charge them? It's zero. Our surveys indicate that most e-scooter owners worry they'll run out of charge on their trips, and 89% are concerned that there'll be no storage at their destination. To solve this, we are establishing a network of universal smart charging e-scooter pods. Through our mobile app, users will be able to access this network across their cities at their local gyms, supermarkets, offices, and mobility hubs. Our universal charging tech and intelligent battery diagnostics enables us to charge any e-scooter, eliminating stress and the need for users to carry their own charger. This universal charging tech also allows us to embed smart charging protocols, which reduce battery degradation increase battery lifetimes by up to 100%, and thereby reduce lithium battery waste. All of this is packaged into our secure and modular pods, which minimize the space required for storage. E-scooters produce 98% fewer emissions than cars. Private e-scooters are a solution to our transport problems at the moment. And by enabling this shift towards cleaner modes of transport, the Honeycomb Network could not only slash greenhouse gas and find particulate matter emissions, but also enable active travel, reduce lithium battery waste, and reduce mobility inequality. Our business model is simple. Honeycomb will own and operate a network of open access sites in high footfall areas like King's Cross Station. E-scooter owners can subscribe and gain access to this network of storage and charging. For private sites and exclusive sites like EDF private offices, they can lease Honeycomb pods as a perk for their employees. We are the first to market. Launching in Paris, if the 32% of uh, e-scooter users will have expressed willingness to pay sign-up, this translates to a revenue potential of £279 million. Since incorporation last year, we've completed an Innovate UK and Office of Zero Emission Vehicles grant project to develop our proof of concept demonstrator, have joined a few accelerators such as the Greenhouse, EIT Urban Mobility and Geovation, and have closed a pre-seed funding round for £127,000. We've had considerable pilot interest from French parking operators, um, and by September, we'll have a CE-certified e-scooter pod with patents filed ready for commercial launch. To bring our product from pilot to market, expand and upgrade our team, and continue to carry out R&D, we're currently raising a seed round for £1.25 million. We're a young and passionate team of Imperial College engineers with expertise in battery storage, battery research, and entrepreneurship. 
We're, our goal is to decarbonize urban transport, and we're just so, so excited for what's ahead. So why don't you scoot over and join us? Thank you. Well done, brilliant pitch. Um, and I think we are being yeah, joined, yes we are, by one of your, uh, your co -founders. Hello. Hi, uh, so everyone, uh, my name's Will, I'm the CFO and co-founder and going to be asking your four questions today. Okay, uh, so first questions uh, coming in uh, around why you've decided to tackle the French market first and why not your home market? It's a really good question, um, and obviously I think it's very pleasant for this, for this crowd. Uh, we actually would have loved to, and we intended to tackle London first, mostly because we started this company to solve our own problem, uh, I suppose. Unfortunately, e-scooters are still not legal to own, uh, well, to ride on public roads. You can't ride your own e-scooter on public roads. Um, this is definitely going to change. We're part of all of the working groups and um, in contact with DFT and that kind of thing, but it likely won't change for the next year and a half, too. So in the interim, we've decided to go to France, uh, which is a very well-established micro-mobility market. It's already 2.5 million there, and it's very well accepted, and kind of the culture understands it. So there's huge potential there, and we've decided to launch there first. And then as and when the UK are ready with legislation, effectively, we'll be able to quickly and effectively transfer over and, and set up our network here, too. OK, um, if we have any other questions, and I'm not going to be uh, bugged too much by the fly, uh, do businesses have the space uh, for lockers? Yeah, so another really good question, and I guess it's always dependent on the market segment. Um, most business, so if we split businesses down into kind of our customer profiles, um, our beachhead is actually car parks. Um, so we're operating in car parks in France towards the end of this year, and they obviously have the space. And because a lot of their incentives are now towards net zero, and for example, in Paris, they're, they're changing all the central zones to car-free zones, so they really have no other option. And there's lots of space for us to utilize there. Other businesses like supermarkets that have attached car parks and or offices that have basement car parks have actually asked us um, how effectively how space efficient our stuff is and we can fit eight pods into one car parking space and they're really excited about that because now they can serve eight people in their offices instead of that one individual. So there is definitely space. The question is around exactly how that exchange of whether they're looking for rent for that space in the highly like high footfall areas or if they're willing to pay us to lease pods like in in businesses like in offices in canary wharf for example um, we have another question in which asks will you be producing the lockers yourselves or are you partnering with someone else for production so um, we're partnering with a manufacturing partner we do a lot of the design work in collaboration with them and at the moment we are in charge of um, the manufacturing and supply chain of our kind of IP, which is this universal charging board. Uh, but in order to scale up quickly, we are partnering with a manufacturing partner that takes care of the majority of the supply chain. Yeah, sorry, I was just, uh, just want to add to that. So um, they have experience designing kiosks, uh, electronic kiosks for many different businesses. Uh, so that expertise, but also their client base uh, will help us to hopefully expand um, and deliver very effectively. Um, yeah. Okay, another question in uh, around the uh, charges that one pod is able to uh, charge in one day in terms of capacity. All right, sorry, these are all technical questions. We'll, we'll ask CFO, and he's very excited to get into any numbers if anyone wants to ask. <laughs> um, so it depends on the battery you're charging, uh, as with everything. We can charge any battery, so that would range from like five amp hour small batteries to 15 amp hour like huge batteries, and they'll take from three hours to five hours to charge depending on also how much, uh, how quickly effectively you can put current into those batteries. Uh, how many charges can you charge in one day? If people switch them out, switch the e-scooters out straight away once they were charged at 100%, probably eight. Just to answer the question. Okay, and how much is subscription? Uh, 20 pounds, uh, but that will obviously vary based on the term length that the user would like to subscribe for. At the beginning, when we're launching our pilot, um, obviously they may not be a large enough network to justify a subscription. So what we plan to do is to offer a pay-as-you-go scheme, and that will help us to validate how much we want to charge in the future anyway. Okay. We have time for another question. Uh, no, I think that is uh, time. So thank you very much indeed. Well done. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, that brings us on to uh, the next uh, pitch, which is uh, from Optimal Slope, developing software to decarbonize mining and make it more efficient. And for that, please welcome Stefano. Hello. 
At Optimal Slope, we are on a mission to transform mining into a clean and efficient business. At present, mining has a bad environmental reputation, being responsible for 4.5 gigatons of annual equivalent emissions. But no mining, no green economy. Car batteries need lithium and cobalt. iPhones need many rare earth elements. Electrification needs copper. In a nutshell, mining is needed to resource most uh, uh, raw materials that are essential for our lives. Most mining happens by a gigantic excavation up to a thousand meters deep called open pit mines. Slope design is critical for their efficiency. Current methods take weeks and offer poor results. Optimal Slope is intelligent software for the determination of uh, the optimal shape of slopes for any given geology and excavation depth. You may wonder, what has the optimal shape of slopes anything to do with mining efficiency? Well, in current practice, most uh, open pit slopes are designed to be straight within each rock layer, in the same way as uh, um, man-made slopes are designed to be straight. But 20 years ago, my PhD supervisor stumbled upon some Japanese castle modes of a beautiful curved concave shape. He asked, why did the ancient samurai build slope this way? And natural landscapes teach us that natural slopes are rarely straight. The quest to solve the riddle led to the engineering question, what is the topologically most efficient way to design a slope. Several years later, and having met my co-founder Andrea, Optima Slope was born to provide the answer. In comparison with the traditional shapes, optimally shaped pit wall exhibit overall inclinations of up to five degrees steeper. So much less waste rock is excavated, leading to uh, both carbon footprint and cost reductions. The software has been validated on four case studies of open pit mines published in top peer reviewed in mining engineering journals. Optimal Slope was able to bring about increments of net present value of 52% and the CO2 emission reductions averaging to 600,000 tons per mine. If all the open pit mines in the world were to adopt our solution, this would lead to cost savings of 7 billion per year, plus 3.85 billion of carbon tax saving, assuming a conservative $25 per ton of CO2 emitted. Also, optimal slope takes away the need for time-consuming interactions between engineering and mining teams, so that the entire design of the mine can now be performed via software. To validate the software, we've been working with software mining companies, geotechnical consultants, and mining companies. We're here in order to raise 800,000 pounds for the development of high quality graphical user interface, integrations with existing platform of mining software, and uh, industrial partnerships and sales. Together, we can change mining for the better. So let's get started. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's start with uh, questions. And again, if you can head to men uh, menti.com to uh, get them in. And let's start with one, uh, Stefano, on the traction that you've had today for your product. Yeah, yeah so um, in terms of tra traction, we've been working with uh, three uh, different uh, um, mining software companies for, uh, in order to integrate our product in their platform. 
and also uh, with leading geotechnical consultants. And uh, uh, we're happy to say that uh, we also have uh, um, a client lined up for uh, a mine. So, you know, the, um, um, let's, let's call it a consultancy job where we've been asked to design a whole mine for this um, mining company. Uh, operationally, what are the challenges in implementing these profiles in a mine? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, so I would say um, the beauty of the solution is the fact that uh, uh, there is uh, no uh, extra challenge in terms of implementing the solution. As it was shown in that uh, picture, um, the optimal profile has a different shape in comparison with, say, a traditional straight profile. But at the bench level, so the steps that uh, were shown into the image, shown like the benches. And uh, at that level, there is no difference. So in other words, um, we believe that in terms of uh, uh, operational execution is uh, business as usual from the point of view of the uh, mine operators. Okay. Uh, another question in asks, will uh, consultants use this or are the mining companies using it themselves? Yeah, very good questions. And um, let's say um, it depends on the mining company. So in short, the answer is both. And uh, it depends on how mining company, uh, the mining company operates, because some of them uh, sort of outsource most of the design. So in that case, clearly the consultants. Some other mining company do more design in-house. So it, it, it's of interest uh, to both, like consultant and mining company, depending uh, how much they do in-house. OK, um, I think we have time for another question. We do. If you have existing algorithms that work, why do you need funds to proceed? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So um, yes, we have an existing algorithm. The funds is mainly in order to get uh, um, two things. One is a, a sort of a really high quality graphical user interface. So um, uh, to be able to make the software in a way a little bit more, I would say, user friendly. And the other point uh, which is crucial for us is integration with existing um, mining software because there are let's say, big packages that they, they do different stages and not our stage of uh, uh, the design of pit walls. So for us to be able to integrate with them, it would really open up a, a big uh, sort of um, database of, of um, clients. Okay. Um, will this work with any type of mine in any part of the world? Yeah, I'm pleased to say yes. And uh, um, yeah, there is no, I would say, um, obstacle for, for the application of this to, to any open pit mine. So, okay. yeah. so, available to be used anywhere. I think that brings us to the end of the questions. Yes, it does. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, next up we have uh, the CEO and co founder of Flex C, which is developing uh, biomaterials from seaweed to replace single use plastic. Please welcome Carlo. Hello, hello everyone. It's been a pretty long afternoon, so I'm sure we're all aware about the problems with plastic. So I'll spare you uh, a lecture about the problems with plastic production, petroleum, and the effects that microplastic have on our health and on the environment. That would be a pretty boring talk, and quite frankly, a quite depressing one as well. What I will do instead is bring you good news, and that is that at Flexi, we have been developing a patent-pending biomaterial which can replace single-use flexible plastic packaging. And we have done so by harnessing the power of seaweed. We do not want to change how people will interact or consume plastic. What we want to do is we want to change how plastic interacts with the planet after it's been used. And that's because people love innovation, but ultimately, they do hate change. No one wants to change what they do, but they all want to do something a tiny bit better which is why our material is perfectly similar to plastic. Transparent, heat sealable, looks like plastic, and feels like plastic. Except that, unlike plastic, it will degrade in nature. It is truly home compostable, and within eight to 12 weeks after consumption, will degrade without leaving behind any microplastics or any other harmful chemical traces. In fact, our material is so natural that it is even edible to both humans and wildlife. We're not just trying to solve the plastic problem, we're also trying to move away from petroleum. And that's where our amazing raw material comes in. We use sustainably cultivated red seaweed. 
that grows incredibly fast in a just 45-day cycle. It also grows without requiring any of the inputs that other land crops require, such as uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And of course, it grows in the water, so there's no fresh water being used and no arable land either. There's heaps of benefits to using red seaweed as a uh, raw material. For example, it takes in a lot of carbon as it grows, as much as 2,000 tons per hectare of cultivated ocean area. It also stimulates healthy ecosystems below water, slows down incoming waves, which means slowing down coastal erosion, and deacidifies the ocean. And there's also an important aspect to consider that there are 100, 000, more than 100,000 subsistence farmer uh, families that rely on red seaweed as their own sole of income. If we can integrate this into plastic production and the huge volumes that that takes, we can give them a much more reliable source of income and increase their quality of life as well. What we're here for today is <laughs> sorry. What we're here for today is to build up on our pre-seed round, which we closed this past spring, and lead onto our seed round, which we're planning to close further down the line this year. What we want to do is seek more funding that will help us validate and finish the development of our current prototype, bring it to a more commercial level, and start to scale up towards more industrial production, as well as working onto the vertical integration of the extraction of the biopolymers that we use in the seaweed, increase the efficiency and sustainability of the process by extracting even more value from other seaweed byproducts, which today are being thrown away. We are a team of young innovators that believe there is something better than what we're using right now. We believe that it doesn't make sense to use a material that lasts 2,000 years to package a product which realistically will only last a couple of weeks. We do not target the post-consumption issue of plastic, we target it at the root. So this is why I ask you today to join us and help us put seaweed and not plastic on the map. Thank you. First one we have in to kick things off is uh, around the use of the seaweed that you mentioned and whether harvesting it harms the environment. No, no, uh, it doesn't at all. As I mentioned earlier, there's many benefits to the seaweed and the seaweed cultivation, which is done already at scale, uh, in fact, is beneficial to the environment because there is no sort of strong infrastructure going to the water. Uh, we're not harvesting from the wild either, so we're not taking into a natural resource which is present and we're taking it away. The way you cultivate seaweed is you tie it up to a piece of rope that goes from the shore out into the, the coast, a couple hundred meters, and it will grow in 45-day cycles. You cut it off, and because it reproduces vegetatively, it means that as long as you keep a tiny bit of it on the rope, it will grow again into another uh, harvest, which in, in 45 days means you have seven to eight harvests throughout the year, which is more than any other land crop. Uh, the next question asks about if you have any uh, customers to date. So we do not have customers to date for the simple reason that we're not um, commercially available yet. Um, we are still uh, developing the technology in the laboratory, and although we do have prototypes which we can produce in a matter of a few hours uh, within our laboratory, everything is done by hand. So we can take in pilots by a very low volume. We could do larger pilots, perhaps, but we would then we would be spending all our time just producing the material and not actually working on developing further to, for it to actually have an impact down the line. And that's not our interest. So what we're doing now is focusing on the tech dev and further down, get those customers. Having said this, we do have several LOIs for future customers once it becomes available, yes. Okay. Next question asks, if uh, you scale to replace conventional single-use plastic, how do you scale uh, seaweed cultivation to match? Um, so I don't know who asked this question today, but I'm going to ask you a question back is, did you brush your teeth today and use toothpaste? Did you perhaps use shampoo? Did you use any kind of moisturizer? Seaweed is used in a lot of products today. Uh, people don't know, but we're using seaweed pretty much daily. Uh, the polymers that we use are the same sort of um, elements that basically make so that when you buy juice at a supermarket, the water doesn't separate from the food pulp. There is a lot of seaweed out there being cultivated already at a large scale. Uh, there's four major red seaweed, in the specifics, uh, red seaweed species that have been domesticated in the past 50 years. And there will be enough seaweed today out there for us to produce roughly 8 million tons of our material. Uh, and there are huge plans to actually increase that seaweed output as well. Countries like 
India, Tanzania, Mozambique, Madagascar, Brazil, with a lot of coastline, have huge plans to exploit this value that they can get from their currently unused coastlines. So in the future, it will also increase. But as of today, it actually is already skilled. Okay, Carla, thank you. Uh, we have another one in that asks, how does the packaging material compare to plastic in material properties, for example, tearing and strength? So this is the wrong way to look at it. Uh, we do not want to compare to a material which lasts 2,000 years because we do not want to last 2,000 years, and that's the whole point of what we're doing. Um, you have to find the match between what you're packaging and what your material can offer. And if the two align, then you've got a deal which is good for the environment. We are not as strong as plastic, although that's part of where we want to end up, and that's what we're doing in the laboratory today. Um, and again, also, when it comes to bio properties, we're not as good as plastic, for example, as water resistance. But it's because if you want to degrade in nature, you need to have some sort of water uptake of the material over time. Well, we do not dissolve in water, we're not uh, like sugar, but uh, water will initiate a degradation process. Other properties, for example, gas, we have a better gas property than low density polyethylene. So it really is a matter of finding the application fit with the material. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, okay, and that brings us to our final innovator of today, the founder of uh, Lifea, an online marketplace which assembles the sustainability of each product, creating a sanctuary for the conscious consumer. Please welcome Manolia. Hello. What does it truly take to make sure that you are sustainable in every single purchase that you make. How many of you have tried? And how many of you have actually succeeded? 80% of people consider themselves to be conscious consumers. Yet only 1% of products sold are actually sustainable. We spoke to over 100 people to try and understand why this is happening. What is it that's taking so many people who go out on the road to do the right thing, give up almost every time? What we found is that it takes too much time, there's a complete lack of information available, there's no visibility and a ton of greenwashing, and that it's really, really inconvenient. Almost everyone we spoke to said that what they really wanted was a sustainable sanctuary. Somewhere where they didn't even need to think about sustainability, where they could have everything that they need within their reach and easy access and trust that it was as sustainable as possible. This is why we're building Lithia. Lithia is a sustainable marketplace. Our mission is to be a sustainable version of Amazon. We bring together all the sustainable products and make sure that it's accessible in a really convenient way. We evaluate every brand and every product for its sustainability to make sure that we're cutting through greenwashing with data. We assess across six different criteria. We look at ethics, energy and water usage, visibility of supply chain, biodiversity impacts, and longevity. We use a really easy traffic light system so it's easy for the end consumer to understand and make this information available on every product page. We also have a tagging system in place to make sure that users can search according to the things that matter most to them, like being vegan or plastic free. We take 25% commission from every sale once we're more established, we will be charging evaluation and advisory fees, particularly for the larger companies with more complex supply chains. We have 60 brands on board as of today. 80% of these are female founded. Women are doing exceptional work in this space. And 70% of our brands are now more sustainable as a direct result of working with us. McKinsey projects that by next year, sustainable sales will account for 5% of the total market. 
This brings sustainable e-commerce to £200 billion globally. We're developing a strategy to acquire 10% of this market, which brings Lithia's sales to £20 billion. And with our commission at 25%, our revenue is sitting at £5 billion, and we're planning to achieve this in the next five years. Our five-year plan is threefold, expand our product range, extend the geography, and critically, to automate our evaluation process using machine learning to make sure we can scale. This will put us in line to being the global leader for sustainable products. We're launching within the month, and we're here to kick off our pre-seed fundraising round, looking for financial partners that can help us empower those that want to be sustainable to be able to make the right choice every time. Thank you so much. I'm Manolia, the co-founder and CEO. We are Lithia, and please subscribe at lithia.com to make sure that you're in line for when we launch. Thank you. Happy to take your questions. Uh, okay, once again, please do uh, get on to menti.com to ask your questions. And we start with one about how you are uh, scalable. Like I said, it's the automation that we're planning in. We're actually not going to start with automation. We're, we're doing things a little manually at the moment to make sure that we're developing a data set to feed our machine learning algorithms. But once that happens, we're going to have natural language processing on place to extract that data automatically, feed it into our sustainability model so it can automatically appear on our website. Our mission is to be as hands-off as possible. Great stuff. OK, another question in. Uh, let's see, asks, how does your 25% fee affect the affordability of the products which you offer? So 25% is actually relatively reasonable. Wolf and Badger, for instance, take 40% at the moment. Amazon takes a ridiculously low amount of number, but that's because it's not their main revenue stream. It does affect the affordability, but at the same time, because we're empowering these brands to do the assessment and we're, we're giving them the platform to be able to showcase the hard work that they've done for the sustainability of their products, a lot of that money has to go towards marketing anyway to make sure that those products can be seen. So it's actually relatively reasonable to the market uh, rates. Okay. Another question asks about how uh, you weight your ethical criteria, for example, emissions versus longevity. So when it comes to ethics, we look more on the people side. Emissions go into the energy, um, the energy rating that we do and the longevity as well. So everything is seen as being quite separate. The idea is that sustainability is really a game of balance. You'll try and fix something in one place, like having organic cotton, for instance, where you know, by being organic, you're not emitting toxins into the environment, but then it uses so much water. So the idea is really to be really transparent about this whole process, to, to let the consumer decide what matters to them. Are they happy with those trade-offs? OK. Um, another question that asks about which kind of product you uh, will start with. So we're, we're starting with a fashion focus. And the reason for this is because fashion currently accounts for 10% of global carbon emissions. It's the most ecologically disastrous industry in the world, and it really makes sense for us in terms of logistics to start with fashion as well. But our, our mission is to expand into other product categories as soon as possible. Okay, so fashion to start elsewhere next. Um, right, with a commission of, of 25%, how do you keep customers from going directly to the companies which products you'll be selling? So we actually have this written into the contract to say that within the geography that we're operating in, the brands that work with us cannot market their product for cheaper. A lot of them have a digital interface which basically puts a block on their websites to make sure that if they're marketing in, say, Spain, a consumer in uh, the UK wouldn't be able to see their Spanish prices. Unfortunately, this is essential for them to be able to uh, afford the logistics that ultimately need to feed into the product price. Uh, another question in asks how you will achieve convenience, for example, Amazon Prime. I, this really, really is key for us. We ultimately are going to partner with uh, fulfillment companies that already offer this level of convenience, and that, again, is going to be fed into the product price. OK. 
Okay, uh, do we have time for one more question? No, that's it. Thank no. you very much indeed. Thank you so much. <laughs>
So obviously, if any of you here are investors and you know, saw startups that you think you, you're, you're interested in, whether that might be investment now, it might be investment six, 12 months down the line, the startups are always very happy to establish connectivity. And there'll be an opportunity at the end by Mentimeter just to express any startups that you want to connect with. I think if there are any of you from, from industry here um, who are looking at startups that you might want to work with going forward, I'd say the startups at the moment, they're, they're early stage, but they're scaling up very, very quickly. As you will have heard, many of them are already doing pilot projects. They're already working with really big corporate clients. So they're, they're very happy to engage, um, you know, enter into pilot agreements, and some of them have product ready as well. So they'll be, they'll be willing to go down, down that road. And then, to be honest, even if you're just curious, you want to learn more about what the startups are doing, um, you know, you're very, very welcome to also express interest in, in getting in touch. Startups will be very happy to spend time with you, um, you know, address any curiosity, any questions that you might have, um, very, very welcome. And then, as I mentioned, we recently started a, a mentoring program. So we have on board about 15, just over 15 mentors at the moment. And they are providing lots of additional support in a really wide variety of areas, it's marketing, whether it's prototyping, um, whether it's fundraising, um, all sorts of different um, areas of expertise. And we're seeing lots of interest from people that have expertise, lawyers, accountants, um, you know, media, um, media consultants. They've got an area of expertise where you know, they want to give some of that knowledge back to um, those startups and innovators who are tackling climate change. So if any of you in the audience you know, feel you're of a similar mindset, then please do get in touch. And you know, we'd be more than happy to set up a conversation, um, invite you in, and you know, see how you might be able to work with and support our startups as well. Uh, we'd love we'd love for that to happen. Um, so, yeah. F finally, you know, thanks thanks again to um, to everyone who's who's here. We're currently collating the the scores. I think Sophie is is wrapping things up, and we are going to present um, you know the first, second, and third ranked from from the audience votes, and then we will um, we will wrap up from there. We will still have drinks and we'll have some snacks available straight after we finish. So we're available until half seven. The startups will. Um, we'll still be around, and um, yeah, we'd love for you to, to stick around. So I'm going to hand back to, to Ria, and then I think we, it's time for the audience awards. Thank you very much. Uh, right, before uh, we get to the awards, uh, I just want to say uh, thank you very much to you all for being here again, but also uh, please do join me in congratulating all of the brilliant startups who have pitched today. It's not easy to come here and do this in front of you, um, and I think they've all done a fantastic job. So if we could just uh, hand together some more. Uh, okay, which brings us on to the third, second, and first place. So, uh, presenting the third place award, as if by magic, David. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, for the third award. Do you want to get everyone up? Or can we present everyone Fine. Okay. Uh, presenting the second place award is uh, Elisa Gilbert, Interim Director of the Centre for Climate Change Innovation. <laughs> and presenting the first uh, place award is uh, Michaela Wright, Head of Corporate Sustainability at HSBC UK. Okay, so we have third, second, and first. There you have it. Uh, so, in uh, third place, um, please put your hands together for Flexi. <laughs> Who are slowly but surely making their way down from um, upstairs, so please do keep the clap going. <laughs> they will be here shortly. Let's see how quickly they can make their way downstairs. Yes, here we go. Well done. <laughs> well done. Impressively uh, running down the stairs too. Um, in second place, please put your hands together for Sarah Tech. Okay. 
Well done. Uh, finally, in uh, third, uh, first place rather, first place, uh, please put your hands together for Deep Meta. I'll just pause for a moment to let uh, a photo be taken. Okay, brilliant. Well done to you all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so thank you very much again. Well done to everyone involved. Before you leave, please do pledge your support via Mentimeter for any teams that caught your interest. Uh, the form will continue to be available throughout the evening and, in fact, throughout the rest of this week too. And you are now invited to join us for some drinks and nibbles in the uh, beautiful library and Georgian rooms of the RI. Um, and as you might have already noticed, each startup has an allocated table. So if you'd like to find out more, if you have any questions, please feel free to connect with them, which just leaves me to say thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Please do make the opportunity to connect um, and we hope to see you at our next demo day in December. Thank you very much indeed.